don't need to fear them because they will be antagonistic towards you. You are decisively the predator in this situation. Because I'm going to have to hold this duck and kind of hug it to hold its wings in and its legs are going to be right on my forearm. When I go in to get my muscovies, whoops, for to slaughter, I put on armor. And so for the kill for this guy, I'm on the ground and I'm going to replace my hands with my, my legs, with my thighs. Because you want to hold his head completely, his palm in your, his eyes in your palm. Those things used to excite me and they still kind of do, but Actually, they definitely do. I love the challenge, but they are exhausting. They're, I feel very taxed afterwards. And so when I come into the shop, I actually really look forward to cleaning. Maybe Justin, you can relate to this because Justin Stolke has his own shop. And those inglorious tasks, the, little, the wrapping, you know, the wrappery. I, I wrap probably more than I cut meat, just in terms of sheer time dedicated to it. And... Um, there's something about those acts that are, it's a good discipline. It's a good discipline. And if you, like all disciplines, if you stick at it, uh, it bears fruit. And uh, it's those inglorious tasks, I think, that help prove to yourself that you like what you're doing, which I think is like the reverse, or that it is your calling even, which I think is the reverse of what... Um, the burden we put on people today, which is like, okay, figure out your passion, the thing that you're good at and the thing that you're like, that you like to do and then go do it and do that when you're like 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, figure that out. But the fact is you, you know, precisely nothing at that age and not just because of your youth, but because you haven't, I mean, this is the case with me. Uh, I haven't done anything. You don't really know what you like to do when you have done none of it <laughs> for any extended period of time. And which is why I kind of like the idea of a trade, you know, you learn a trade willy nilly, will you or nil you, whether you want to or not, you learn a trade uh, because we can't trust your likes and dislikes to direct your whole life, right? The thing you're going to do when you're so young because um, you just don't know anything. So you just learn a trade. And then, uh, which we don't really do anymore. And you keep doing it and you keep doing it. And uh, I think that what can happen is, it's, you might not know what your calling is until you, you do it for a long time and you find yourself sacrificing for it. And then, be, because the thing that you love to do and that maybe you're called to do is, uh, it might not be the thing you feel so great about, right? or at least not all the time. That's just such an unrealistic utopian uh, expectation, you know, that you're just going to be, it's going to be feeding your soul the whole time, undiluted enjoyment of the task nonstop, right? It's just so easy for that to indulge the shallowest parts of your, of, of your composition, of your nature. <clears throat> Basically pleasure, which is, you know, for the whole cup of human nature, that's like, the, that's just such a small, tiny fraction of, who we are and what we have needs for. But when you do something long enough, you find that you, you might retrospectively find, as you look back on it, like, wow, I think I've sacrificed a lot to do this. I do it when I'm tired. I do it when, I, when I'm hungover. That's a good test. Uh, I do it when um, I don't want to. And what that means is that you love it right? Because you're sacrificing for it. The thing that you love to do uh, is a thing, the thing that you love is a thing you sacrifice for. And it's when you kind of realize that, that suddenly you can, en you can enter more fully into the task, into the duty or into the calling. And uh, it really, it, it makes you less a slave. So this is what I see. It makes you less a slave to just the pleasure principle, right? Which is so good for, uh, your everything you know 
And I, 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 so it's such a crime to me, you know, particularly for young people, when we, we say find your passion and do that, it's like, it's sort of like saying be a slave to very shallow enjoyment of what you do. Um, it's like, no, there's, you actually need more than that. You need a lot more than <clears throat> shallow enjoyment in your life. And uh, you definitely don't want to be a slave to that. And when you aren't, when you become the master of it, and you can actually extract, you know, uh, dare I say, even pleasure from the ignominious, inglorious, thankless tasks, uh, then you are, you're more a master of yourself rather than being mastered by your circumstances. And uh, like John Milton says, paradise regained of uh, his, the way he, 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 uh, he personifies Jesus. Paradise Regained is an epic Renaissance English poem that I studied a lot. Uh, he says uh, the the goal basically in the narrator voice is not a paradise outside of you, not to find the paradise where everything is as it ought to be. Everything's ordered and, and it, it feeds you, you know, you're in the right context where all of your, you're in flow. What do they call that now? You know, they have like the psychological flow thing where you're right on the, the border between uh, order and chaos, which I get, you know, that makes sense. It's this psychological state of where we're being stretched, but not too far, but still stretched. And that's all good. And as long as you locate that in your circumstances, in an external paradise, you're a slave to uh, where you are. And what Milton says is that the much higher and the better place to be is a paradise within thyself, happier far. Because that means you can be in a context of utter misery, but not be miserable. Um, and that is, a, I think that is a better strategy. Uh, so it's been fun to, I, I experienced that on a very minor level, you know, over the years. Because uh, I, st I do all this stuff alone. You know, I don't have any help. Lauren will come in and help when she can. And I keep trying to uh, disobligate her from helping me because she already does, you know, only like 200 times more than I do in a single day. So the notion that she would come out here and help me is, well, it does damage my pride a little bit. But also, I feel like I just, she, I want her to be able to do the things that she needs to do. But, uh, as I take, you know, I do all the thankless tasks. I, you know, I clean out the grease trap. I wrap the meat. And I've seen a shift over the years where at the, as the day, as the years progress, I, I look forward to those things. I actually desire to do them. Whereas before they were the, the dross, they were the things that got in the way of the real job, right? Which they're just annexes. These annoying like obligations around the real job of butchery or slaughter. And uh, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that those are actually, that's where the rubber meets the road. Um, it's uh, the little battles, the little way, as you might say, uh, where, where the real battles are won, the tiny things. <laughs>